Pyongyang had a military parade and rally on Kim Ilson Square on Thursday, a day before South Korea holds the opening ceremony for the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics. Kim Jong-un attended the military display and said the parade marks the DPRK's emergence as a global military power despite facing the worst sanctions. In such situation in which the U.S. and its followers make motion around the Korean Peninsula, our military should maintain a high level of combat readiness so that the invasive forces cannot infringe upon or harass the republic's secret dignity and autonomy even by 0.001 millimeters. This comes after U.S. Vice President Mike Pence's words on Wednesday in Japan. I'm announcing today that the United States of America will soon unveil the toughest and most aggressive round of economic sanctions on North Korea ever. And we will continue to isolate North Korea until it abandons its nuclear and ballistic missile program once and for all. The parade marks the 70th anniversary of the founding of the DPRK's military, initially held in April. Before the opening of the Olympics, Kim Jong-un is going out of his way to make sure the DPRK will command attention throughout the Games. Kim Jong-un not only sent a delegation to the Pyeongchang Olympics, but also his younger sister, Kim Yo-jong, to attend the opening ceremony. Pyongyang's contributions to the Olympics have generally been welcomed in the South. The parade, however, was more problematic, casting uncertainty over the Korean Peninsula. On Thursday, the North Korean military parade. On Friday, the opening ceremony of the Winter Games in South Korea. One event after another. What is really happening? Joining us to discuss about that, we have in Beijing, Ms. Rong Ying, who is the Vice President of the China Institute of International Studies. Welcome, sir, to our program. Thank, Thank you. Thank you for being with us and share your insights. Meanwhile, joining us in Washington, D.C., Jenny Town, the Assistant Director of the U.S. Korea Institute at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. Welcome to our program. Joining us also in Washington, D.C., Jonathan Pollack, Senior fellow at the Center for East Asia Policy Studies at the John Thornton China Center of the Brookings Institution. Welcome to the 3W. I want to begin by asking Ms. Tao, as you've been doing research about the DPRK for quite some time with your colleagues in Washington, D.C., what do you make of the North switching the day of the Army Day, so-called, from April to right before the opening ceremony of the Winter Games. Well, this isn't really a new development. Um, there were actually two military holidays uh, that used to be celebrated, and then they switched it over to April, um, which was actually the founding of the Revolutionary Army. Um, and the switch back to regular Army Day and the founding of the Korean People's Army um, of uh, February 8th is really um, it was done a few years ago, actually, mm. back in 2015. So it wasn't something they did just for this uh, year, and it wasn't necessarily intended to be just before the Olympics. But as the 70th anniversary of the Cre Korean People's Army, um, you know, we did expect to see some kind of celebration, and especially um, for domestic audiences, really trying to promote um, and celebrate um, mm. the advances they've made in their military. Right. What kind of message, uh, Mr. Pollack, do you think the latest celebration and the parade uh, send to the United States, if there is any? Well, I, th I think what this highlights is the, 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 the dual aspects of uh, North Korean strategy. On the one hand, trying to convey to the United States that their nuclear weapons capabilities are here to stay, uh, that, uh, that they're not giving any consideration uh, to uh, Pairing back on these programs, but at the same time, of course, the presence of uh, North Korea and of senior North Korean officials, including uh, a member of Kim Jong Un's immediate family, mm. uh, in uh, I at the Pyeongchang Games, tries to highlight what the North sees potentially as some kind of an opening uh, with South Korea, some ability to insert itself in the domestic debate in South Korea. Right. Whether this 
materializes and sustains any momentum, I think it's just too soon to tell. Too soon to tell, but some facts we already know. All eyes may be on the VIP stands instead of mm -hmm. the pitch in Pyeongchang. Some say the DPRK delegation will include Kim Jong-nan, the DPRK's head of state, and also Kim Jong-un's sister, Kim Yo-jong. The American entourage, of course, will include Vice President Mike Pence. So, well, the first daughter, Ivanka Trump, will also attend the closing ceremony. Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe will also attend uh, together with the UN Secretary General uh, Guterres there. Uh, although the DPRK has ruled out any forms of talks between Pence and DPRK officials, but many wonder anything could happen at that moment. Having said that, though, Mr. Rong, coming to you, what a drama. I mean, <laughs> before the games, the opening of the games, when going into the games, and the closing ceremony, and probably after the games. Do you think there is some kind of fair assessment, do you think, sir, you can give about what's likely to happen? Well, it is a games, and it is a games more than all, I mean, the, the games. Uh, of the games. <laughs> and I think it to be, uh, of course, there are high expectations, but there are also, I think, realistic expectations. High expectation is the hope that because of this uh, momentum, um, I would say positive momentum, yes. uh, w it is hoped that it will lead to some continued sort of. Uh, uh, inter more intera positive interaction in the sense that it will first uh, help the two Koreas to uh, normalize the relationship and in the long run it would also help the peninsula, I mean the tension mm -hmm. will reduce, prepare the ground, I mean yeah, in the sense that the, uh, the resumption of, uh, uh, of peace talks. Yeah, even, okay, even that's the bigger dream. Uh, yeah. What about the immediate dream if there is any? The immediate dream, of course, is a peaceful, safe Olympic Games in winter, and uh, hopefully, I think the uh, some beside, good feelings can yeah, be created. Right, right, between the two Koreans. Besides, of course, the the the, the performances of these athletes. Right, you know, so. but here's a question, uh, Miss Tao: Is this going to be the Pyeongchang Olympic Games, or this is already the Pyongyang Winter Olympic Games? <laughs> I mean, it's a good question, and I, I think even just the way that Vice President Pence has been talking about it is making it actually the Pyongyang Olympics rather than the Pyeongchang Olympics, um, and overemphasizing their presence, and also in, a, in an unconstructive way. So both, uh, both North Korea and South Korea have really gone out of their way to show a high-level commitment to the games themselves and to the opening of inter-Korean dialogue. Um, and it does seem that the Trump administration is trying to, trying to sabotage that and trying to prevent that from getting anywhere and trying to prevent um, the spirit of the games to mm. even shine through. But, but is that a fair, fair assessment? I wondered, uh, Mr. Pollack, I mean, according to Vice President Pence, he said we never seek talks, but at the same time he said all the time that we'll see what happens. You know, when it comes to a politician say, we'll see what happens, you just don't know what he's talking about, right? So that means, in a way, anything could happen. So, <laughs> Mr. Pollack, what do you say? What is your assessment? Pyeongchang to Pyongyang Olympic Games already? Well, I, you know, I think, well, well I, I think that these should be the Pyeongchang uh, Olympic Games. And uh, the, the heightening of uh, the rhetoric uh, that uh, Vice President Pence has expressed uh, I understand in some sense why he's making these statements, but I don't think in the, in the moment uh, it really uh, adds value uh, to, to, the, to the situation. What we can highlight, of course, is that international athletic competitions are among the very rare opportunities where there may be some interaction between uh, the North and the South. We've seen this before with the Asian Games, mm. for example. We're going to see this even at a higher level now uh, with uh, such senior uh, North Korean officials present. To me, though, the critical question is how does Moon Jae-in yeah. handle all these circumstances? He wants this to be a very successful Games. Uh, on the other hand, he's going to be having lunch with the entire North Korean delegation on Saturday. What will he convey? Every time South Korea has expressed concerns about the North's nuclear weapons development, North Korea has always said it's really none of South Korea's business. Mm. So he has a question to ask, how does he negotiate 
the complex relations not only in the inter-Korean context, mm. but also in the context of his own uh, domestic circumstance, which has not necessarily looked at the decision to invite North Korea or okay. let North Korea participate uh, with, op with open arms. Well, uh, Jenny, I have to come back to you because obviously Mr. Polak has already kicked the ball into the court of South Korea rather than the United States. So is it going to be South Korea that's going to play and absolute proactive role or actually the United States attitude is of the most important thing to push anything positive forward. Jenny, your input. You know, it, it's, they're really working against each other and I think, you know, what you're seeing now is really the discord between Washington and Seoul as to how to deal with this issue. Um, you know, the idea that Pence would announce new sanctions right before the Olympics really prevents any type of um, casual interaction between, you know, the delegations um, during the opening ceremonies as people were, are sort of speculating on. I think it's um, good that Moon is being able to meet with Kim Yo-jong and the high-level delegation when they're there, and I do hope that um, they can find some common ground and start to talk about, you know, what it will take not only to denuclearize, but first to really repair relations and to de-escalate. Um, and especially if they don't have the support of the United States, what does that mean going mm. forward? And I think it's, it puts Moon Jae in a very difficult position, and it will be interesting to see how he navigates that. It will be very interesting to see that, and also interesting to see how other players are interacting on the site. Uh, Chinese is also sending its own delegation, not just the sportsmen and women, but also official delegation. So Mr. Rong Han Zheng will be there. So he's a, like a special representative of Chinese President Xi Jinping. So what kind of role will China play on that site, the opening ceremony, at some of the dinners, some of the lunches? What is going to be China's role? I think China will continue to play a kind of a role to facilitate and promote kind of a dialogue. First, of course, I mean, the, uh, we have sub expressed the support mm -hmm. and welcome the support to the inter-Korean, the two-Korean dialogue. And then secondly, which is uh, even more important, is that China has expressed the hope that uh, North Korea and the United States finally would find a way to talk to have a dialogue, not, not necessarily I mean, a negotiation at this moment, mm. but to resume a kind of a talk, to send a positive signal to help to, the, I mean, to maintain uh, the uh, momentum of this uh, the, uh, uh, right. uh, 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 researching, which I think is uh, being very important to keep them. Yeah, keep but having said that, though, here's the ultimate question, ladies and gentlemen, that is, who is really having the key about the future? about what could happen and what should happen. Is it the United States? Well, it plays a role. Is it South Korea? Well, it's very active trying to seek something to happen. Is it going to be North Korea that is actually holding that key as to what eventually would happen and have a big impact on it? Or is it, South, is it going to be China or Russia or some of the other players? That, I think, is the ultimate question. Uh, Ms. Tao, what do you think? I, I don't think it's up to any one player anymore. The, is the this game diplomatic is answer you are giving now. to me? <laughs> it is. <laughs> uh, but, you know, the thing is, it's not just the U.S. DPRK problem because, you know, there is the U.S. South Korea alliance, mm -hmm. um, and all of these factors um, have a big impact on how we move forward. And so, yes, um, Pyongyang is sort of in the driver's seat in terms of what they will accept, what they won't accept, because all of the all of the energy is really targeted towards getting them to move in a certain way. Um, so, but the problem is now you have South Korea wanting to go in a more peaceful route. You have the United States wanting to put more pressure and really squeeze the situation. Um, and now you have this discord between the U.S. and South Korea. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily a wedge strategy, but it, it's certainly a discord of how to move forward. Um, and it is going to complicate the situation in a way where no one player is going to be able to control mm. the situation. It's really going to be um, a complex mix mm. of how everyone responds. 
this is much more than the drama of a 007 movie, I have to say. On the one hand, there's a <laughs> Winter Olympic Games that is going on. On the other hand, everybody thinking, what is secretly happening in those, uh, you know, around those dinner tables and in those uh, private corners when it comes to discussions. So, Mr. Polak, I want to invite your expertise as well. Is Pyongyang now taking everybody's nose in a way, leading everybody toward the direction that it wants, or actually Washington does have a big role play and it's better for Washington to shake up and play its constructive role. Mr. Polak. Well, well I, you know, again, uh, the fact that uh, Kim Jong-un made his initiative uh, in his New Year's address in a lot of ways should not surprise anyone. Um, South Korea had been seeking this uh, from, uh, from the outset of the Moon presidency and until that point of course North Korea had stiffed the South repeatedly. But you know this is one of these rare opportunities where North Korea uh, in the context of an international Olympic competition has a way to heighten its visibility even as it's a very constrained visibility, mm. uh, you know, even if you look at the number of their athletes that are competing, many of them are competing as an exception to the Olympic rules, not because they actually qualified. So, That's right. in, in a sense, n South Korea has extended itself uh, quite deeply here. But, you know, several things I think are more notice. Number one, um, we have heard nothing of late from President Trump. Uh, and uh, I frankly would find it a big surprise if uh, there is a not at least one or more presidential tweets uh, <laughs> over the coming uh, days, <laughs> depending on how the circumstances evolve in Pyeongchang. Um, there are a lot of, as Jenny has indicated, there are a lot of well, moving pieces here. It's no one is really controlling this in mm. any real sense. At the same time, the critical question remains. In the aftermath of the games, uh, a, 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 as we go back to, I don't want to say business as usual, but you know, as the United States has indicated, it will resume its military exercises right. in April. Do we just simply think of this as a momentary pause, or is it something that has some degree of, of uh, I don't want to say sustainability, but at least some modest opening uh, well, to see whether there are other possibilities, because the fundamentals are, are still very much there, as we were very reminded much by there. the military parade today in Pyongyang. Yeah, yes, indeed. Uh, Mr. Polak, I'm glad you asked that hard question. I was thinking about maybe we could have just a moon, uh, honeymoon, five minutes, and then you already break that silence. So let's <laughs> lead to that very hard question. What's going <laughs> to happen? You know, what's going to happen after mid-March? All the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games comes to an end. Are we going back to business normal? And probably even worse than normal because that happened before when after a big celebration there was relationship going even further down rather than up uh, between the North and the South or North's relationship with the rest of the world. So, Mr. Rome, what do you think? I mean, you've been in this field for 20 years, sir. You know what happened and will the lights of the past shed over here this time after the games also. Yeah, I think uh, I would argue that this is simply because the uh, past experiences, I mean most of them we, we, we came I mean, with, uh, w w with uh, high expectations and then ended up with uh, the kind of business usual or business I mean, worse, worse, than worse than usual. So that's why I think, as far as I can see, the Chinese government, the foreign minister, I mean, even himself personally, called upon I mean, the parties concerned, particularly the United States and the DPRK, which China believe they host the master keys for this issue, uh -huh. that they would, I mean, uh, uh, work hard so that to find a way to dialogue and, I mean, and to conduct the kind of contact and dialogue and so that when the games, uh, these games are over, then we're going to have a new and a different situation, you know, in the sense that it would help at least uh, lower or, mm. or reduce the tension, prepare okay. the ground for further, I mean, rooms for diplomacy. All right, but the, the thing is, Jenny, Ms. Town. I mean, the DPRK is making a lot of effort to get the spotlight. You know, the squad, the cheering squad, the uh, performance troop, and also the uh, yeah. together team, 
you know, hockey women, and as well as coming into the opening ceremony as a whole team from the Korean Peninsula, it made its effort on the surface. The question is, is the on the surface effort just decoration for some real efforts to do the other way around? Or it is going to be the prelude for something of real commitment for some, at least about talks, not even say what kinds of talks, at least about talks, Ms. Town. Well, you know, I think it's notable that Kim Yo-jong is going and Kim Yong-nam and the high-level delegation that's going, mm. along with all the cheerleaders and all the athletes and stuff. <laughs> and um, I do think a, a lot matters as to how the meeting between Moon Jae-in and Kim Yo-jong goes, mm. um, if they can establish a relationship, if they can have a real discussion with each other and build some kind of, of momentum there. I do worry, too, though, is that because North Korea is so much in the spotlight on this Olympics, if the, if the overall publicity of this becomes very negative against North Korea, mm. it could also derail any future, um, any potential for a future dialogue beyond the Olympics as well. All right. um, because North Korea is very sensitive to that as well. It is. Well, we talked a lot, but we have to wrap up this discussion for now. All eyes on the opening ceremony of the Winter Olympic Games in Pyeongchang. And that's going to be on Friday. We're going to come back to you for a discussion about that too tomorrow. For now, I want to thank the three of you, Rong Ying, Jenny Tao, Jonathan Pollack. Thank you so much for being with us. All the best. And you're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on our program. Imagine the power of soccer to help unprivileged children. That's what German sportsman Jürgen Grinsbach did, and he talked about his experience with the group. Street Football World. And Canadian architect Douglas Cardinal's glowing designs famously blend with the landscape. In our exclusive interview, we'll talk with him about how his Aboriginal heritage shaped his career right after this. Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight coming to you Monday to Friday live on CGTN. Football or soccer is not just a game, but rather a great uniting force. An universal language we speak and a common culture we share, whether at the finals of the World Cup or on the streets of a rural town. Football has the power of bringing people together and bonding them with a sense of community and companionship. The best football matches are played by united teams with a shared vision and the same principle applies to driving social change. Earlier, I caught up with Mr. Jürgen Harry Greensback, who is the founder of Street Football World, which is a global network of community organizations with the goal of changing the world through soccer. He shared his insights on the spirit of football with me. Street football. That's a great topic, particularly when you think about the popularity of soccer these days. So how is it being done? So what we have started 15 years ago is, uh, I is to identify organizations that work in their communities using football as a tool for social mm -hmm. transformation. That can be from HIV and AIDS prevention to landmine risk education to homelessness to social inclusion, migration or peace building. Mm. So what football does is actually it helps you to speak to the group you wanted to speak to, like youth, yes. who is motivated by football, and to keep the young people long enough in a process in order to work on behavior change. Mm. We see a lot of countries uh, that are trying to look to soccer as a way to bring up uh, their economic and social change, China included, mm -hmm. but the level of soccer playing, particularly in international competitions, mm. cannot be complemented. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have any medical remedy for our streets? Yeah, I think... Um, I mean, football is, first of all, it's accessible to everybody. And you probably might find even talent at the end of the day um, if, if you use football more on the grassroots level. 
So you, the, the, the easiness, the simplicity of football should be used in order to really mobilize young people to become active. Mm -hmm. So either they develop towards sporting talent or they, de they develop towards citizens' talent. And, but at the end of the day, they will contribute to society. Mm. So we have now 15 years of evidence that it works. We have now a network of 130 organizations. We know how yeah. football actually adds value to, uh, to social development. Mm -hmm. We're working in 80 countries with around about 2 million yeah. youth. It's, it comes back to the simplicity and at the end of the day with soccer you speak to half of world's population because it's sort of their shared language Absolutely. And, and that helps a lot if you want to um, get across like values you believe are important for our global development. So for example team play. So we now have learned, or I hope we are close to learn, that we need to team up in order to tackle the challenges mm -hmm. of our times, therefore the global goals. But how do you actually mobilize a world's population behind a shared vision? I think football can help as an enabler. Football has become such a politics these days, for okay. example, where the World Cup is likely to be held and all the politics related to FIFA, for example. You serve the ones on the board of FIFA. Uh, of social responsibility. Tell me about that aspect of soccer. Yeah, and we can go, go on with the list. There's match fixing, there's doping, there's a lot of things that are sick in the industry. We need to use that word because mm -hmm. it's really bad for, for, for football at the end of the day and it doesn't represent the values of football, mm. of the core of football. And therefore I think if the football industry doesn't do something very consistent towards not losing the relevance in the life of people, it might, it might be the end what, of football. What kind of consistency are you talking about? I'm talking about the consistency with the values of football. Mm -hmm. So football is not about corruption. Football is not about um, m m fixing matches or it's not about doping. It's not about um, things that are just like being done in order to mm -hmm. concentrate like power in order to maximize profit. Mm. What we are here about is football as actually a tool that inspires a global mm. community. Where is the starting point? What is the likely to be a systematic change to soccer? I mean, you've been working on the street soccer. You've also been working on the mm. biggest the international organization when it comes to soccer. So where is the starting point? I think it's very difficult um, to expect a, a dramatic change within a system mm. that's not built to change, that's built to just protect itself. That's, I'm, and that's not only in football, it's also in other systems yes. we can see that. So-called vested interest. Yeah, exactly. So what we just started five months ago is an initiative that's led by actually the football players. It's called Common Goal. Mm -hmm. And it, this, in, this is an attempt to actually help football to bridge the gap back to being relevant to the people. Mm. And what the football players do is actually they collectively pledge 1% of their salaries into a social impact fund that then is being invested in order to maximize social change. Mm. Into what kinds of projects? Who are it, the participants? That are um, success proven local organizations that are using actually football as a tool for social I transformation. See. Who are the participants? The participants on the football player side. Yeah. So Juan Mata launched it, the Man United midfielder, but there's also Mats Hummels from mm. the German national team or Giorgio Chiellini from the Italian national team, mm. then Alex Morgan or Megan Rapino, female. US mm. world champions. So we're 40 now, 4 yeah. zero up to the moment. We just started five months back. And re just recently, the UEFA president signed up. Um, so we're starting to get closer to the regulatory bodies. And at the end of the day, the idea is to make it a standard, to make it a new normal in the yeah. industry. Well, what do you think about the future of uh, soccer, particularly when you look at the countries and the regions where the World Cup is being held and to be held? Yeah, it's obviously very controversial. I, I, I see that and for the right reasons, I think, because how we don't know how exactly it actually came up um, as, as, the, as the decision. But at the end of the day, it's also, if we want to look at it like that, it's also an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So now we have, let's say, the 2022 World Cup in the Middle East. Now let's have the dialogue, let's have the conversation. And I think, and opportunity also on the level that these are societies they're hungry to change, mm -hmm. they're hungry to contribute. So now let's 
let's leverage this opportunity. How to make soccer once again a game for everybody? When I'm saying game for everybody, I'm not saying that you got a chance to play it, but rather it's going to be the equal game. Mm. It is also going to be equal game among countries, whether you are poor yeah. or you're rich, to be able to hold the exactly. host rather the World Cup. Exactly, and also for male and female. So we're not sure. just stopping here in the existing structure. I think it's all an exercise of reframing of what would be possible, mm -hmm. and then work towards that, and not take the limitation of the current system right. as something that holds back. How long have you been playing with football, and also the idea of soccer? So I started motivated by the assassination of Andres Escobar in the 90s. Yes. He happened to score an own goal at the World Cup in 94, came back to Colombia, which was the place where I lived, and was assassinated, was yes. killed. Um, so that was the moment when I thought, how how to, can we manage to translate the magic of football to actually everyday life and use it as a tool mm. for transformation mm. and since then I'm engaged in that. What kind of streets are you imagining when it comes to street soccer as you have claimed uh, in your organization? A street actually for us means public space and accessibility. So it's not necessarily the street, it's actually be open, be accessible, yeah. be for everybody and that's what, what, football make, what, what makes football so, so magic. Football is a magic sport. Well, we are going to from moving from football to architecture. Douglas Cardinal is a top Canadian architect who grew up in the Aboriginal tribes. Earlier, I sat down with him to talk about how he instills his Aboriginal heritage into the real designs. Before our exclusive interview, take a look at this first. Natives in the America land. The indigenous peoples of the Americas used to be forced into a corner by European colonists. Now, more and more people are devoted to protecting Native Americans' ancient culture. Douglas Cardinal is one of them. As Canada's best known architect, his projects are famous for showing his Aboriginal heritage. Born of German and Algonquin heritage, Cardinal has always embraced his Native cultural and aesthetic values. As primary design architect for the National Museum of the American Indian, Cardinal's curvilinear designs represent the nurturing female forms of Mother Earth. His Ujibugumu village layout, centering in the traditional Shaptuan and open to the four compass directions, has collected ideas from the local community. The Canadian Museum of Civilization, now renamed as the Canadian Museum of History, remains the most prominent example of Cardinal's style. A building rooted in the surrounding natural world with a distinctly native sensibility. Well, I was thinking uh, of the Rocky Mountains that are the backbone of the continent, and they became the backbone of my design. And then in the Ottawa River and the waters and glaciers of the mountains, I saw how nature and water carved those rocks to form those forms. And so I looked at the building in that way, that if it was to express Canada, it should express the land itself, the rivers, the mountains, the rocks, the, uh, and, uh, and also the forms. But also I wanted to combine it with uh, forms of man and nature, because I wanted to say uh, to the people, as my message as an artist was, mm -hmm. Unless we live in harmony, in balance with the land, we will have no future. Now think about it. Everybody would agree with you. But back then, decades ago, this is quite a new idea. Well, that's the difference. The elders kept their knowledge in the mountains, kept it away from, from being uh, colonized or changed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was trained by the elders in the mountains. We have to tell who way. the elders are. They're the books of knowledge of, of our uh, Aboriginal people. How long were you with them? Oh, uh, 15 years. Wow. Uh, basically working with them, uh, Robert Smallboy uh, and Raymond Harris, I remember his teachings that all life, all life had to be respected and that, the, uh, that we're a part of all living things, that mm. we're not from nature, that we are nature. Whatever we do to ourselves and to our environment 
affects all life. Mm. He also said that we are the grandchild of all the generations that came before us. Mm -hmm. We're the grandfather of all the generations that come after us. Within us is the past, the present, and the future. So whatever we do, we have to be responsible to our ancestors and to all the future generations. That is our responsibility. You were born with a German mother and a Canadian Indian father. Yeah. You lived in the community with your parents, matriarchal society, but yeah. later you were trained the well-established Western style. Yeah. And what does this combination mean to you, both life and profession? Uh, my mother felt that, uh, for one thing, that I should have a very good education, and so did my father, because he wanted, he realized that with a good education, you have freedom to be anywhere in the world. Mm. Indeed, though, I was, uh, um, in a sense, spent most of my education in a convent, because they wanted, they wanted me to be separate from society in a way, and learn all about the arts and all the culture and architecture and music and all the arts so that I could be able to have two worlds, have the beauty of the indigenous uh, community mm. and the beauty of the Western world mm. and to be able to combine those knowledges together to create a new way of thinking. Later you became a very well-known architect and you did serve the Aboriginal community a lot. For example, one project you did, which is called Ojibukomo Village. I just tried yeah. to learn to pronounce it right. Tell us about that design, because you seem to have a huge team of consultants. Well, they c called me up and asked me if I could help them. Uh, the, the chief, actually. Uh, the chief of the village. The chief of the, the village. The Aboriginal village. Yeah, the Aboriginal village. He says, could you help us? We want to design a village. And they lived in nothing, tar paper shacks. They had nothing. How many of them? There was, uh, we had uh, five, 600 people. And then you did your presentation. Yes, and, uh, and I encouraged them to criticize. At first they said, oh no, uh, uh, how can we criticize? Look at all your degrees and everything. We don't know any, anything about planning. And I said, in your hearts, you know it all. You know what's right for your people. And uh, you're not going to hurt me by criticizing me. You'll hurt me if you don't. Mm. Uh, and so uh, they all got up and then they, they were like piranhas, they did. <laughs> tore me to shreds. So I wrote everything down, yeah. and that was new knowledge. And I was, they were teaching me. Mm. I had a lot to learn. What did they teach you? Something you still remember today. Well, they taught me that they wanted the village to be in a circle, mm. with a center in the circle. They wanted it open to the four directions, uh, because they wanted to relate to bring in their ceremonies in the center. They, they taught me that they wanted the shape of their village to be like their, uh, like their past villages so they could bring in the ceremonies. Uh, they taught me that they wanted to be able to build it themselves so that they could create jobs and opportunities mm. for their own people. Uh, they taught me how much they respect and love their children. Their school had to be designed around their children. Mm -hmm. So many things I learned from them. And all this had to be reflected in the design. And so I, I would uh, they would criticize me and, and give me all this new information and go back <laughs> to my office, redesign it. And then they, they were on trips like uh, they were, had a goose break, so they were out hunting goose, they were out hunting moose. So I had to go out and drive out where they were hunting moose. <laughs> They had Following a, all their hunting trips. Yeah, yeah, their hunting trips and everything because they wanted their village right away, but also they had to uh, feed themselves and follow right. their traditions. So seven or eight times? Eight times. Did you revisit it again? Oh, all the time. Mm -hmm. We just finished uh, a few years ago building them a whole museum yeah. to enshrine their language and their people. And they have a programs in the Museum of Civilization, mm. now called the Museum of History, to be able to uh, help them manage their collections right. and preserve their collections 
for the future of all Canadians. You, know? you really provided the architectural design of the National Museum of the American Indians in Washington, D.C. Yeah. Later, there were a lot of zigzagging in the overall cooperation. Now, when you reflect back, what came into your mind? Did I step back? The important thing is that the building is there. And it still reflects the vision of the Aboriginal people of the Americas. That's the important thing. Now, things were a little bit lost. From your original design? Yeah. But For I example, the, the very top of the building. Yeah, it was cut back because the architect uh, from New York who took over the project uh, didn't have the technical knowledge to solve the problem. Was it a pity to you? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, I wanted to make sure the vision of the elders was the most beautiful thing in Washington. Mm -hmm. It's like our Aboriginal people in the last couple of hundred years. We've been badly bruised. Mm -hmm. So the building then is a reflection of that. And there's not much you can do it. It's truly an expression mm -hmm. of the way it is. So we, we're looking at that monument. Yes, it's bruised but so are people's hearts bruised. Mm. It's not just architectural designs, it's also politics. It's also relationship with the investors. It's also what's going to be the impact of the architecture. Eventually it came into being. You as an Aboriginal architect yourself, you have to deal with all of these. You just have to believe in the goodness of people. Mm. You talk to people heart to heart. I mean, uh, most people have big egos and you know and mm. and sometimes one's head interferes with one's communication mm. but when you're speaking from here you can communicate with anyone and that is all the time we have for today if you like to see more Try to find us World Inside CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and see the way ball. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Inside team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.